At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial grade supplies for every industry with same day pickup and next day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call, clickgranger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. I'm talking with John Foster, and John is the author of a couple of books that I think are absolutely fantastic because they give you a really broad range background behind what can happen with a UFO ET encounter. And I don't know if our language is correct with this, but we're going to work with what we've got. It has to do with being aware that what we see in our reality isn't necessarily everything that's present. And when you have somebody who's had a behind-the-scenes overview, and John is in his 80s now, and this happened began when he was a small child, that person giving us this entire history as a frame of reference is absolutely a treasure. Okay, so this is a diamond that we're looking at that is pure and essential if you want to know more about what's happening to us as a species with our consciousness, our evolution, our growth, spiritual, physical, mental, the whole nine yards. This is the little thing, the key to our evolution, okay, because it's happening behind the scenes on a grand scale. And I loved seeing John's information, finding him, and and thinking, oh, my gosh, here it is right here in plain view because John has left a wonderful trail of breadcrumbs to give us some, I think, insight to be behind the scenes of how this works. Eminent discovery, he originally put these out, I, you know, just getting them out of his head and into the mix and then went through and revamped. So Eminent Discovery Volume 2 is the one we're going to be referencing. And then To Earth from Heaven, two books that give you, a, oh my gosh, just tons and tons of information. But John, I wanted him, I'm like, John, 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 I have your information. I've been on your website. I really, I've seen your YouTube videos. I've seen the presence of, you know, all this information, but I still want to hear from the person because this is how, and oral histories are huge throughout our centuries of being here on the planet. And when we share our stories, we engage in a different way. So, John, I am so glad. Thank you very much for talking with me because you have an absolutely astounding story. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Wendy, because you have a lot of insight, and most people really don't want to hear about this. And I've gone, uh, my case is a little bit different than most uh, in the respect that I didn't really know what was going on until I was uh, 48 years old, and that was 1986. And uh, I was outside on the patio uh, one night, and during the 80s, uh, I would have strange feelings that I knew uh, something was going on, and I actually had those feelings um, all my life, but they were stronger in the 80s. So I was outside on the patio, and I saw the city lights reflecting from uh, the clouds up above, and it just really made me uncomfortable. And so I went uh, in and went to bed, and I remembered that some people remembered their UFO encounters after being hypnotized, so I decided I would try to concentrate and remember if I had ever had an encounter. And almost immediately, a picture flashed in my mind's eye, and I saw a windowed saucer uh, flying above me, and, and so I tried to... F- um, understand what happened before that and after that and it was a chain reaction and there was just a flood of memory that started to come back about that encounter and that was at the Bethany Great School Playground uh, here in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. That encounter is Chapter 2 in the Imminent Discovery Volume 1 if anybody's interested. And uh, there were several things that uh, just shocked me because it indicated that we're, we were had a contact with beings and crafts and strange objects that we don't normally see. And to give you an example, during that uh, Bethany encounter, there was a crowd of 30 to 50 people there, and uh, the craft 
to make a long story short, the craft hovered above us, and the voice started speaking to us from the craft. And uh, he said that they were going to take five or six of us aboard, but not to be afraid because uh, they could make us forget the experience if that's what we wanted. And then he introduced the first person that they were going to take up, and it was a young gal who had just graduated from college, uh, a nearby college, and she waved and smiled. And and then uh, uh, he introduced a couple more people, and it was as if they had dealt with them in the past up the street, you know, where she lived. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I was eventually taken up, and I won't go through the whole story. There's extreme detail in uh, Chapter 2. Okay. Uh, Anyways, I was put on an examination table, and they told me, among other things, that I would have um, heart attacks and heart surgeries in the the future, and that the veins in my legs would have something to do with it, which has happened now. That was uh, 30, I think it was 38 years later. I did have my first uh, massive heart attack and heart surgery, and I lost over, eventually lost over half my heart, but that was in it, uh, 88. Wow. And so I survived uh, uh, since then yeah. for 30 years. And we, I've just seen my, uh, my one of my cardiologists, and he said, well, you have more than beat the odds that you're, <laughs> you're a miracle. Yes. <laughs> so I've... I've lived a lot longer than most people after um, more than uh, half my heart was destroyed. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so the way it happened, rather than starting at my uh, when I was uh, two or three years old, right. which was my first recollections and possibly before that, because um, I uh, can remember an encounter where I had diapers on and we uh, our car stopped and we saw a luminous craft out in the field next to us. Okay. So going back to 1986 then, um, I struggled with this uh, from early September until August. Uh, My wife and I took a trip, and I started remembering more. It tells a story in the... Volume 1, how how this all happened. Mm -hmm. And then from October, November uh, 86 through uh, February of 87, I just had a flood of memory. It was completely overwhelming, and I would have records of uh, different encounters from um, the time I woke up until I fell asleep at night. And this even included uh, recollections that when I was supposed to, I was an engineer as an applications engineer, and I was, of course, supposed to be working, and a lot of my memories took up my time at work, which really wasn't fair to uh, my friend, the owner of the business. Yeah. What I remembered is extremely complex and lengthy, and it involves um, humankind uh, since our very beginnings. Um, It's much more, I was raised as a Christian, and I'm still a Christian, uh, uh, probably have more faith than most people because I have facts to back up what's written in the Bible, um, uh, sometimes in extreme detail. Mm -hmm. Uh, My concept... Uh, is um, not exactly what your typical Christian would accept, you might say. Do you want me to get into a summary now, or do you want me to explain other experiences? Part of it is the experiences that you had, they could manifest out of nothing, out of the fog. All of a sudden, this would be present. And there are multiple witnesses, but only a few remember. You talk about the grade school experience. There's also a football stadium experience. And that's what's so fascinating is that, um, as you describe it, some people saw it. Others people continued doing what they were doing. And some people were engaged. It was the whole spectrum of being there and completely oblivious. Well, let me explain one of the football encounters. Um, It was a very simple encounter. Um, My wife and I were... um, at a Nebraska football game in the uh, uh, stadium, and um, the 
was a timeout on the field, and I looked over. We were in the end zone near one of the corners, and I looked over in in the corner above the people. There was a manifestation of fog that took place, and it was like a hissing roar. It gradually began to dissipate, and there was a craft. Uh, it was what I call a dish-shaped craft uh, with headlights, uh, two headlights on the front, and it manifested above the people, and I could see that the people were looking at it and pointing to it. There was a roar over there, you know, finally. Mm -hmm. Then the craft started moving in our direction out in front of us, and we were about halfway up on the stadium. I could see people in front of me pointing at it and asking their neighbor what that was. And so I pointed to it, and I asked again, what is that? And she says, "Uh, I don't know what it is and so we kept looking and it went over to our right and then it started going up over the stadium above the heads of people uh it was about um i would say 10 foot to 15 foot above above the people Mm. and it finally disappeared over the stadium and uh during that time or before or after that time i can't remember where it's right now but they had called a timeout on the field, and there was a fog that developed on the field, and I believe there was a craft that momentarily manifested, and the, the referee called it another timeout, and they waited until the uh, fog cleared from the field, and then they started playing football again, and I thought that was shocking, you know, why yeah. wouldn't yeah. we'll really be interested in what's happening. Anyway, we left the stadium, and as we were walking out, there were there was a fellow that was talking to his comrades, and he, he was asking what in the heck that was. And so we stopped and talked to him about it for a time. And then we went on about, you know, to go home, and we never did hear anything about it in the newspapers or anything like that. And this sort of thing happened many, many times uh, throughout my life, and I'm sure it happened to people also. Uh, you, uh, I gave you the reference to Brad and Sherry Steiger's book, didn't I? Yes. And the best way to get a handle on the story is to go to John Foster UFOs.com and scroll down and uh, watch the video of a talk I gave to the 2001 UFO conference convention in Laughlin, Nevada. And I covered six months on that um, presentation. I did a lot of the drawings uh, for that. And uh, it explains pretty much in detail uh, the different types of craft and the different types of men. There were a lot of times there would be a strange man, man that would walk up, or we would find standing beside us, and he would be he would start explaining what was going on and so forth. At uh, those times when uh, the craft also showed up, and then there were what I call the lizard-like beings, uh, and I have drawings of that. Mm-hmm. They normally piloted the craft, and uh, they actually taught me how to fly the craft uh, two or three times uh, by thinking it forward, So, which indicates um, a different reality, you might say, mm-hmm. that's on our reality. Also, uh, what might help your listeners understand a little more is that my father and I were hunting one time, and we saw what I call the large booth uh, in behind uh, um, Milo Field, I believe it was. And so we stopped, and the, or the car stopped. Actually, uh, we didn't stop. Our car stopped, and the door flung open, and there were beings. I don't know if I actually saw them or if they were. It was just the voices that I heard, but they told us we had to get out, and we had to go do something they didn't really tell us and so we started moving and not of our own accord and we were with uh, close to them because we could hear them talking and so i decided i would try to escape and i moved off away from them and they sort of laughed at me and told me that i I couldn't 
because uh, I didn't know what was going on, and I wouldn't survive if I if they, I didn't stick with them. Kind of a long story, and um, we had an out-of-body during experience during that encounter, and they told me, they showed me and told me how they could um, uh, manipulate the craft or create the craft by manipulating the atomic and molecular, molecular uh, structure of matter. I assume from the molecules and atoms of the haze and fog, mm-hmm. because at times we would see what I call the coffin-shaped object sitting on the ground, and uh, several times we went up and tried to touch it, and our hands went through it, and we felt um, a, loud, a mild electric shock. Mm-hmm. And then it would move off, and the voice would talk to us, and we would see the lights and so forth. And um, that's also included in the books and so forth. Do you have any questions now, or yes. that you want to direct me in a certain? Yes, I do, because there's there's an obvious thing where you are. This is intentional. They've selected you, and you're agreeing to go along in your own in your own way. Still, you know, not sort of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Not like you have much choice with this, but when you're talking about trying to escape and them saying, you're not on the same plane, this isn't going to turn out well for you, so just come on. <laughs> um, there's a, a, yeah. You're with a guy, at, and this is, at, I think, at a, a football stadium encounter where you're with a young man, and the young man kind of um, creates um, an opportunity for a rumble, basically. you got, he, he gets you into an, an argument, I think, and you go downstairs and this is a setup. Do you remember, you, you know the story I'm talking about? Yeah, that was at a basketball game. Um, the craft actually manifested inside the auditorium, and I was a past, pre- I was the president of my senior class in high school, at Northeast High School here in Lincoln, uh, the first semester, and um, I think it was after the game, uh, all the students kind of gathered in the um, foyer, which was large, and there were several people there. And there was a one of the opponents, guys, a little scrawny guy, started pestering one of the girls, and it was, you know, he was in a sexual matter. I would look for somebody that would take care of, you know, somebody bigger than I or tougher than I yeah. that would take care of this little guy, and nobody would. And so I, I told him to back off. And he said, well, I'll just meet you outside. So a friend of mine and I went out, and we went down the stairs by the Coliseum, and there were like 10 guys there, and they were just going to beat uh, us up. Right. And a craft showed up, and the voice spoke from the craft, and it threatened the guys, and we saw a chance to escape, so we ran up the stairs and, and left. Mm-hmm. But that's a... That's a short encounter that um, just tells you a lot. I mean, it tells yeah. about reality. Yes, yes. It's incredible. And that that's part of what I like about your story is there's an engagement and an interaction here that, that it, it doesn't mean they're going to bail you out of every every problem, but it means that if there is a reason and a need and you were trying to protect somebody else, um, that, that you had a, a basically a backup <laughs> The, the yeah. many, you know, that well, many of us don't know about. Yeah, and it kind of still bothers me because uh, they won't show up again. And, uh, you know, I, I want them to come land in the backyard and walk over and let's sit on the patio and have a cup of coffee and you explain to me, you know, what this is all about. Uh-huh. Even though they know a great deal about what it's all about. Uh, but they, I had one last experience uh uh, and I got extremely angry. It was at Maloney Lake at the campground uh, south of North Platte, Nebraska. And uh, to make a long story short, the voice um, asked me why I was so angry. And I told him, well, it was because I couldn't remember the experiences and it was ruining my more normal life. And as the conversation went on, he said, well, we don't want you to use the word we. So we don't want you to remember because it would negate the purpose of the encounters. And then after a short period of time, they gave me a choice. They said I could choose to remember and not continue the experiences 
or not remember and continuous continue the experiences because that's what they preferred because I hadn't developed enough my metaphysical and spiritual talents to be able to carry out my task. Mm -hmm. um, Of course, later I found what my task was through recollection, but uh, even during that last encounter, they uh, levitated me out over the lake, and uh, I saw three people that seemed somewhat familiar, and a large building uh, manifested also out over the lake. It was a masonry building, which is impossible. And um, so I remember the voice talking to me at that time, trying to get me to decision. And I thought to myself, uh, almost out loud, that, well, I don't have to do anything at all. I can just ignore him, um, you know. And so that's what I chose to do. And then that was in the summer of 1986, after I had my first recollection of the Bethany Grade School encounter. And we went on to the uh, Tetons in Wyoming and Dubois, which was a small city where I worked when I was younger, and we had friends there. Uh, I logged, did logging and um, uh, worked for the Forest Service and broke and trained horses, 1956-1957. And this was in, of course, 1986. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I started recalling more at that time, but then we went home and we had another trip, and I remembered more and more and more, and then finally in in November, I just flooded in. And then the extreme, one of the extreme important things to remember is is that uh, after I had recalled all of this uh, in late February, early March, in that spring, I don't know if it was April or May, I went to Shirley McLean's friend uh, who wrote, Shirley wrote out on the, out on the limb. Yeah. If you, yes. And I met her friend that had been with her in um, South America, and he talked about UFOs and so forth. Mm-hmm. I walked into the auditorium and I started recognizing people all around me. And uh, it was so f- freaky that I got up and my daughter was with me with a friend. And I got up and stood uh, at the side of the auditorium and tried to look at these people and find out, try to remember who they were. Anyway, I couldn't, and we didn't have a chance to talk to Shirley's friend, but uh, I went uh, home and had more recollections and discovered I had had time travels uh, into the future. And... Um, nearly every time uh, there was a craft that would show up and there would be uh, the same human individuals on board and we would fly off to specific location or locations, uh, different locations, but primarily one location where we were shown and told what we were to do in the future. And it involved a vast ET human project that involved uh, other people, of course. And one of my jobs, uh, eventually, I learned was to help with the construction, the design, the construction, and maintenance of some of the buildings. And uh, the buildings um, were housing units. They were what they called spiritual learning centers and so forth. And one was a one of the first buildings we were to construct was a high school for uh, Central Americans or people that came across the border, the southern border, especially orphans. And uh, the group that is to help uh, did the teaching, supplying of clothes and food and housing. So after this Shirley McLean's friends talk, my daughter called me one day. She was living in eastern Nebraska, and she worked with a gal who heard my story, and she wanted to meet me. So she met me, and at that time, she explained that she I needed to meet with these people that she knew that got together weekly to improve themselves, and that they had some of them had similar encounters that I did, and um, that, that later that week. Um, my daughter and I drove to the area, 
and we drove up to the building, and it just freaked me out because I recognized the building and the landscape around the building. And it, uh, we were to go to the first meeting, uh, uh, or our first meeting with these people. And it bothered me so much, I took off, and I told my daughter I couldn't, you know, something's wrong. <laughs> I can't do it. Mm-hmm. But I really mustered my courage, and we pulled up in the parking lot, went into the building, and I started recognizing the rooms in the building, but no one was there. And uh, all of a sudden, I knew where to go, and I told my daughter to follow me, and we walked through uh, two or three different rooms and opened a closed door, and there were um, about 12 different people sitting inside. And we said hello and so forth, and uh, we got to talking. I recognized almost everyone in the room. Mm. And, um, uh, they, Some of them recognized me, and um, uh, we started exchanging stories. And then, they, of course, they asked me to come back and, uh, and uh, to, during their meetings, and so I did. And I brought some of my drawings and so forth. Yeah. Uh, a couple of the people uh, recognized the drawing of the first building we are to construct and so forth. And I uh, was sh- shocked to find out that um, uh, they were already adopting uh, Central American orphans and uh, putting them in families. And uh, different families were adopting them, and they were providing education, housing, and food, of course. I want to get back to what your task was, but what is it like for you with the headlines today with the South American immigrants, and not only that, the huge numbers now, now that are separated, the children that are separated? Is this reminiscent of what you saw? Oh, yeah, it's, it's taking place. As I spent, sometimes I would go up and I would spend time three times a week. Things were not developing the way that I would, I thought they should develop. For instance, families were breaking up. There would be a woman that would leave her family and her children to participate uh, in the project. Mm Mm-hmm. And she wouldn't go home at night. And um, there were other things that happened that I didn't think were in the best interest of humankind, you might say. Of course, I would. I realized I was no good position to judge. Right. But my wife and I got so bad. My wife and I uh, separated for about 18 months. And I finally decided that unless they show up again in explain in detail what this is all about. I'm not going to participate. And so I did, and um, uh, my wife and I got together again, and things have been just great, you know. Mm -hmm. Project is not developing the way I was shown because of that. Okay. The other question I have, your task, what was the task? My task was to design and help with the construction of the buildings, and the buildings were um, schools, spiritual learning centers, and housing. Uh, I wasn't so much connected to the housing as I I was the schools and the spiritual learning centers, and so I I did, you know, I had some architectural training, and I was a home builder uh, for several years, Mm -hmm. and... um, so I drew the plans for the first building, and some of the plans are shown in the volume two, I believe, of Imminent Discovery. Okay, yes, yes. And there should be some in um, Imminent Discovery illustration picture books. That that book was written, or I published that book because people were not really uh, comprehending the extent of the story, how vast and complex it was. So I did... A num- I did about 170 drawings about what had happened to me, and mm-hmm. I give the um, location, the time it occurred, and time and date, or the date normally, and ex- have a little explanation about what had happened, and that's in Imminent Discovery Illustration book. So you can get a kind of a quick overview from that book. 
and then I wrote, uh, I started writing uh, Eminent Discovery, and um, Neil Sprinkle, who used to hold a UFO conference in Laramie, Wyoming, he's actually uh, part of the reason that I did so much investigation. Um, he was a psychologist that set up the only, it was the only conference that was oriented to help people like me uh, deal with our encounters. Yes. Uh, they were helping people all over the world, and especially in the United States. Uh, for instance, uh, there were people that were placed in um, mental institutions because they told their story, mm-hmm. <laughs> like I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, was, I really had a fear of being, and I was, uh, you know, professionally, I was a research and development engineer, and I was working for this one company as an applications engineer, and I, um, of course, uh, uh, that was before my heart attacks, and, of course, I didn't want to be exposed so that I would lose my job and so forth and so on. Anyway, what triggered the heart attacks? Oh, I know what triggered the heart attacks. Another um, another psychologist came out to learn me. He, he wanted to meet me and hear my story. And then eventually, in 1988, he asked me to give a talk to the Psychic Studies Institute in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. And that was Fowler Jones. And... Um, he was just a kind guy that, uh, you know, understood what was going on. And so I agreed to, uh, when he first asked me that on the phone, I felt a flush of adrenaline just in my body. It was out of fear and partly anger, I think. And uh, I eventually agreed to do the talk, and I gave the talk, I believe, in October, November. I can't remember right now. Anyway, I went down, and he kept the uh, audience uh, small, he said, so that I wouldn't be so um, afraid. Right. And I got to meet some of the people there in Kansas City, and um, I gave my talk, and everything was fine. And I was invited to go to um, Unity Church uh, headquarters there near Kansas City, mm-hmm. and I met people there, and uh, they were, of course, extremely interesting. Then I came home, and um, I was, uh, during all that time, except for the talk, I had uh, massive chest pains and a pain in my solar plexus, yeah. and my doctors thought I had a hiatal hernia or uh, something like that. Anyway, I came home and then had a massive heart attack and then heart surgery and so forth. So here I am, yes. still alive. Yes, <laughs> and that's astounding. Okay, well, I want to go back to, I mean, with your experience, your background, and your longevity, you have a broader perspective. You've had a chance to integrate a lot of this, and uh, some people don't have that luxury. They people get don't it. know it in detail like yes. I know it. Yes, yes, and that's, that is why this is so, I think, fantastic that you're giving us this broader picture, and the fact that, they're not telling us for a reason. You know how they give you a problem. Somebody gives you a problem, and you have to do your own work. <laughs> oh, <you bet. laughs> they won't tell you what the end is supposed to be because if you can't do the work, it won't matter. All right. So you, yeah. you, you're an example, a living example of someone who was given an opportunity and a challenge to ma- maybe see how this works for humans. Period. I mean, we're not all agreeable. And some of the folks you were with said, absolutely, no way, no how. And you said, um, and you kind of took it one day at a time. And so I think with that, there's a value of seeing that the more you allowed it to unfold, the more you were able to see these other people who were also involved and see that this isn't just one person, one continent, one piece of society. It's the planet that's extraordinary. Exactly. And um, um, the I think it was sort of an experiment to see if humankind could handle um, extra, extra terrestrial, you might say. Uh, it would be extra dimensional, actually, um, existence with a um, spiritual connection to entities, intelligent entities, 
on the other side that we can't see. Yeah. Uh, beyond the veil of the visible, a lot of some writers like to say. So there's a barrier, and we're sort of prisoners uh, uh, within our, the five senses. Uh, and if we don't want to, or if we haven't been touched in some way to realize we don't see that other side of life. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yes. I really wanted to see a UFO before all this happened, before I started recalling. I wanted really bad to see a UFO, and I actually said a prayer to God, the Father of Christ, the Creator of the universe, that I needed, I knew something was going on, I want to know what the the ultimate truth really is, even if it kills me. And, and I, I think I said that out loud. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> and, oh, it was a couple years before 1986. And, yes. Uh, and then in 1986, it all happened. So, uh, wow. 86, 87. And then uh, things happened after that with the what we like call the familiar strangers, the people that I rode with in craft uh, into the future to be shown what we are all uh, told and shown what to do in the future. Let's. I want to back up there. You, ha- yeah. you in the books you say you have been shown other things, and because you changed your program, they may not play out. But what can you share about the future that you have seen? that still is basically on the table? Uh, basically, the project, um, I've seen, I've met people uh, from all over the world who have had encounters, okay? Mm-hmm. And there are organizations uh, set up to understand more about the spiritual side of life, you might say. It, of course, goes along with a lot of the things that you have written about and spoke about. However, it's diverse, Um, and I figure, you know, I was in research and development, so I look at things very objectively, and I don't accept things that are not rational or uh, have some kind of evidence that it's true, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, I read uh, Zachariah Sitchin's Earth Chronicles, and it was sort of a godsend to me because uh, it, was, he, it was a story about ETs uh, developing the world and creating, uh, aiding the creation of humankind. Yes. And essentially, that's what I was told twice. I was told that uh, they had helped with the creation of humankind using something similar to test tubes. And so when you think about genetic engineering and so forth, and uh, the, the Bethany Gray School encounter, for instance, uh, Chapter 2 of Human Discovery, uh, suggests that they indeed are doing genetic engineering now and mm-hmm. probably have been um, throughout the centuries. And, uh, of course, they did uh, originally to create the first man and woman. Now, that people are afraid of that because it seems to... Um, contradict what's written in the Bible, but I maintain that it doesn't, that it just expands on the knowledge of what is really going on, that there is a God, there is, and you could call him the uh, Father God, and there was the Son, who was, which is Christ, and he was the Son of God that came to earth and to explain to people more about reality and uh well, you should, shouldn't kill your neighbor, in other words. Yes. And you should treat other people as you would like to have them treat, uh, treat you and so, and so forth. So if you if you read just the, not necessarily consume everything that's in the Bible, but if you read the words of Christ, it's, it brings you towards uh, closer to the total truth of what's going mm-hmm. on. He's the point of the Bible, the Christ, the message, the Word. Yeah, uh, right. Well, the, it, it, he's the point of the uh, Christian Bible, yeah. I need, to, I need to tell about the experience at the Sheridan Creek Fire Guard Cabin in uh, 1957. A friend of mine were working as fire guards there, and we had one lengthy encounter where they actually told us uh, what it was all about, and there was no symbolism or 
vagueness about what they said or what we saw. Mm-hmm. And essentially, they said they were the monitors or keepers of the earth who were responsible to a hierarchy that included the archangels Michael and Gabriel, who we would refer to as Michael and Gabriel, who were responsible to the entity who we have known as Christ, who is in charge of this corner of our universe. Uh, so now um, you can accept all that. They didn't talk about the Father, the creator of the universe, except you can extrapolate all kinds of things to assume that that is absolutely true. Okay? Yeah. Um, and part of the, part of the um, mystery is that I don't know if you're familiar with the Masonic order or not. Vaguely, but, but yes. Okay, well, a lot of people think that it's evil and so forth, but I, I am a Mason. I, uh, before I had my recollections, I became a Mason, and I can tell you that it's one of the best uh, sources for men, especially, mm-hmm. to become um, civilized and kind and generous and so forth. Um uh, that's the main thrust of the order, the mm-hmm. Masonic order. Okay, and women are involved, of course, and I'm not I'm not trying to sell this at all because right. I'm an, a- an active member just like I'm an inactive uh, Christian. I don't go to church much. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, but uh, some of the best, um, I, got, I used to get together with the familiar strangers, and we found, uh, even in the talks I've given around uh, the country, th- there was always a battle on who was the best source or knowledge about uh, who was the most prominent person or could be the most prominent person in the UFO discussion. Mm-hmm. And it sort of just made me sick, you know, so I backed away. Oh, it's sort of a diversion. In other words, um, there are a lot of... Um, spiritual people also that know the answers, you know, and they, they're sure they know the answers, and uh, there's a lot of people that wanted to heal me, and of course in the New Age movement in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of healers around they wanted to heal. Well, some of it was genuine and some of it was not so genuine, so... Uh, I decided, of course, along with my decision to back away from the project, is that I would, uh, I always wanted, my mother taught me when I was very, very young to live by the truth, whatever the truth was, okay? Mm -hmm. So I always sought out the truth, what was real and what was not real. So I backed away from, I gave my last talk uh, at uh, the Psychic Studies Institute in uh, uh, Unity Temple in uh, on the square in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. But at that time, uh, I took, our kids were remembered encounters, and so I asked them if they would be willing to uh, witness for what they saw and how they felt and so forth, and so... Uh, our three kids don't went down with us, and uh, they gave a spiel about uh, the Dylan Lake experience, which uh, yes. all three of them remember parts of it. Yes. And it's pretty profound. I mean, uh, even though some of their memories are short memories of different episodes, uh, <clears throat> but it's um, when they told me that they heard the voice speaking to us and when they saw the craft and how it looked and so forth, I knew... Uh, in 86, I knew that what I was remembering was true and accurate. Mm-hmm. The one thing that I do think is also prominent throughout your stories is that they always had to factor in the Native Americans. There was some, there was like a mantra that they repeated over and over again. You were, you were directed to take care of the plants and the animals, the planet. That, that was a common theme. Yeah, my dad was the chief of the Nebraska State Fisheries. And um, he was the assistant director of the Game of Parks Commission. Well, I can tell you one time the experience at Memphis Lake. Um, our whole family, my two sisters and I, we were young teenagers. And there were several things that happened. The UFO showed up. And uh, there was eventually a large, what I call the large booth that hovered above the lake, not too far away from us. And we heard um, my father's friend and a fellow employee in the in the booth uh, yelling and screaming uh, that he had been abducted. 
And uh, my father all of a sudden said, uh, he didn't know what to do, but all of a sudden he said, I know what to do. And he took off his shoes and he waded out into the lake. And a pure blue blue beam of light on towards him, and when it hit him, he instantly disappeared. We then heard me and the other guy and the voice uh, talking and arguing up in the booth about what to do as conservation officers. Uh-huh. <laughs> they were getting a lecture? They were getting a lecture, yes. And uh, <laughs> my mother, of course, was afraid, so she put us in the car and we started to leave. She wanted to save us. And we uh, drove around the, the bay and the car stopped and she couldn't start it. And so we sat there, and I, I, I believe I had a time loss at that time. Mm-hmm. So we were finally, we woke up, and uh, she was going to take us, the car started, and she was going to get us out of there. And my sisters and I said, no, you can't do that. We have to go back and save my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> With that, so I'm come waiting out of the lake, and uh, they told us, uh, eventually, they told us to forget all about it, and we didn't have to worry about it, and that was, that was it. Wow. <laughs> and then we didn't talk about it after that. That's another thing. You were oftentimes t- told, you know, this isn't, you don't need to remember it, and that... Right, exactly. <sighs> anyway, we asked, uh, we asked the other family about it, and they couldn't remember anything about it in the morning, but uh, they sure did while it was happening, and they were involved also. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one interesting thing is that uh, they had a young boy a little younger than me, and we were good friends, and they were in, um, uh, he was the superintendent at uh, Shadman Park in northwest Nebraska. Anyway, um, we were up there. Am I going on too long here? No, go ahead. Okay, we were up there. uh, We used to go up there every year, and um, we were up there on the uh, in the swimming pool uh, bathhouse. And a boy came in and said there was a helicopter that uh, was on the lawn above the lawn uh, at the entrance to the park. So we went out and we saw a craft with brilliant lights and. uh, so forth, and there were there were things that happened there, and um, anyway, everybody forgot about it. So in nineteen, I believe it was nineteen eighty six, um, I was of course worried that everybody would think I was crazy. So I began to think that I needed to contact some of these people that were with me, uh, so they could verify to me what happened. Otherwise, right. I wouldn't consider I was going crazy. Yeah. Anyway, so I picked the most obvious encounter, and that was what I felt was the most obvious encounter. And so I called the guy, and uh, who was a friend I hadn't seen for decades, and I asked him about it. And he said, "Oh, sure, that was a helicopter um, above the lawn at the entrance to the park." And I said, "Well, uh, tell me, it described what it was." And he started to describe it, and he said, "No, it couldn't have been a helicopter." because I don't remember the popping sound. It was kind of a horror sound. Mm-hmm. And we talked lights and so forth, and he finally um, knew that it wasn't um, a helicopter, and uh, which was really a relief for me because yeah. it, I knew that I was on to something. Anyway, um, later, I think it was one or two years later, I met with him at uh, in a hotel here in Lincoln, and uh, I took my drawings, and I, we talked for a while, and we, I recorded his um, statements, and I threw a bundle of drawings out on the table, and I had to go to the bathroom, and I went to the bathroom, and I heard him yell, this is what I saw, and he picked up the exact drawing out of a stack of 30 to 50. Mm-hmm. Yeah, validation. The, yeah. We're going to have to wrap, but what I want to say is that your drawings and your extensive, explicit recollections, these these are, uh, for some people, will be a lifesaver because it's going to validate other people who've been afraid to talk and don't know who to talk to and need some kind of indication that what they're experiencing isn't fiction or some kind of psychological issue all right and that's what you've been you've had a chance to work through with the the fact that you saw this 
in the company of others who've been given, you know, in some way, shape or form acknowledgement for saying, yes, this is this is what's happening. This is what's going on. What would your message be now to people who are experiencing this? What have you learned? Well, um, if I would put myself in their position, I would just state that uh, we don't totally know what's going on. We have to live life through faith. And uh, the best thing that I've run across is that, uh, you know, that there is a creator, and then you have to have faith that the Creator is going to take care of you. And um, also that you are part of that creation, that you, we are all creators of our own world. So we have to make decisions about what we want to do uh, the next minute or, the, or tomorrow or uh, for the next year or whatever. So we live in isolated worlds from one another, but we also have contact and we need to struggle with the good times and the bad times. The bad times are really good teachers and so have faith and get through them. The church is uh, really good uh, for some people and uh, for some people it's probably um, not so good but there are other people around if you talk we used to get together with the familiar strangers and um, we I, they put me in charge of the conversation, and so I would tell them that everyone has a story. So there was normally a person that would want to take over and control the group. So I would say, well, let's just take 10 minutes and go around the room and everybody say whatever they want to say. And then uh, we'll go around again, and uh, then we would say, okay. If there's anybody that wants to talk longer, now is the time. Mm-hmm. So they would talk and tell their story. And if everybody didn't get to talk that time, we would make sure they got to talk the next time. And then we would uh, dismiss and we'd have lunch. And this was normally on a Sunday. And we would just kind of talk to whoever we wanted to talk to. And people would come out of that and say, this is better than going to church, that I've learned more today than I have all those times I went to church. So it's connected, for sure, uh, to the goodness of life, but they use whoever's controlling or whoever set it up also wants us to experience uh, con- uh, conflict yeah. and discourse. Yes. And that way we learn what the goodness of life is, or, and we we grow towards a more eternal life, you might say. Do you think they plan to, at some point, make themselves more visible? And it seems to me that that's what this is progressing to, that we are evolving to be able to accept not only the others that are unlike us on this planet, and technically that's where this is going, and that that, that way we could accept others who are not of this universe. You know, I think there there will be some of that, although I'm not sure that it would include everybody on Earth. Um, I think people are at different stages of development, and that's one reason that America is so wonderful, is that you can um, decide, being you being a creator also, you can decide what you want to do and how you want to feel. Mm -hmm. Uh, Basically, in the ultimate end, it's how you feel and who you are. Yeah. <laughs> and what your your emotional feelings and also your spiritual emotional feelings beyond the body is the most important thing. So if you have goodness in your heart and that's the ultimate goal, then you're okay yeah. Uh, yeah. no matter what happens. My interview with John Foster, this is a full version. I had to edit the other version that aired on KCMO because of time constraints. So this is actually more of our conversation The fantastic drawings he has are included on his website. You'll see incredible accounts of his 
lifetime of memories from the time he was a kid to 48 years old when he said, I'm done with this, please, I can't, I can't deal with it anymore unless you give me full disclosure on what the purpose is. So on the website at johnfosterufos.com, you'll find more of his story, more details. You can also get the books available on Amazon, Eminent Discovery, Volume 1 and 2, and that is just absolutely astounding what he was able to remember. And as you heard, it gave him three heart attacks. This, this blew him out of the water. So if, for more information, again, check out John's website, johnfosterufos.com, an extraordinary story. I've included interview links on my blog, wendyscoffeehouse.com, and you can check that out there as well, trying to highlight some of the things. I bought one of John's prints, and I'm really excited to see that because it's the one where the UFO comes out of the cloud. And this suggests our reality is completely unlike anything we believe at the moment. To experience this firsthand is why I wanted to hear from John in his own words what it was like, because hearing the story from the experiencer, I think, gives it so much more credibility. Anyway, I really appreciate John taking time to talk with me, and hopefully I'll be able to connect with him again. But for right now, you can check out his information again, johnfosterufos.com, and find out more details about his incredible lifetime of encounters. Very much worth reading and investigating and exploring and comparing notes with other experiencers as well. Because as he says, this is ongoing. I'm Wendy. Wendy's Coffee House, KCMO Talk Radio. Hi, mija. Abuelita's on her way and I still need to shop for the party. No worries. Let's order through Instacart. Insta qué? Sí, llama. We can order groceries and more online and get everything delivered in as fast as an hour. Everything for dinner? Carne, tortillas, limas, plátanos. Claro. Anything else? Just make sure the plátanos are ripe. Get groceries delivered same day with Instacart so you have more time for family. Visit instacart.com or download the app to get free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Additional terms apply. When things feel a bit chaotic, Instacart helps deliver milk and sausage. Add a little life to your cart. Get stuff from literally all your stores, from baby wipes to albacore. Add a little life to your cart. Instacart helps get your groceries. Your first three deliveries are free. Download Instacart. Add life to cart. Terms apply. <laughs> 